This is your generation, baby. And back in the day, you just wanted all those older folks just to f- f- fade away. You don't want them to dig what you were trying to s- s- say. And you weren't trying to cause a big, big s- s- sensation. You were just talking about your g- 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 generation. Your generation, baby. You thought people were trying to p- put you down just because you were g- g- getting around. Things did look off cold. And you were saying, you hope you die before you get old. Well, guess what, my friendly baby boomer? <laughs> we're getting older. And longevity is the topic this month on the Retirement Answer Man Show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. And if you are new here, this is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement. We want you to rock retirement. And we are that generation that is now getting older. And we're going to have to understand and plan for longevity if we're going to rock retirement. And that's what we're going to cover this entire month on the show. And we're going to start today with how long might you live? And throughout the month, we're going to explore habits to help you lean in well to this longevity and talk about the personal aspects, but also how to make your money last. But you know what? We can't do any of that until we have that all important disclaimer. This is that all important disclaimer. So don't try to act on what I say, because this is just friendly hints and education. And before you take any action, my friend, talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor, because that is just common sense. Now, before we dig into all of this longevity talk and determine, okay, how long might you actually live? In our practical planning segment, I want to talk about some common misconceptions that we have about this whole retirement journey when it comes to life and when it comes to money. And we're going to do that in the hot topic section. So recently in the Rock Retirement Club, our online community where we got some really awesome people all walking the journey towards retirement together. You can check it out at (laughs) rockretirementclub.com. We were having a great discussion about common lies or misconceptions about retirement and money and all sorts of things. We And we had a great discussion about it. And so I thought I'd share some of the more common things when we're talking about investing and retirement that are, quote unquote, the general rules that we take on face value, but really are not the full story. And oftentimes, especially with money, it's easy to get fooled by numbers and statistics and things like that. So let's start with the first one. And that is that the average return on the S&P 500 since 1926 has been approximately 10%. Now, as a statistic, that is accurate. But did you know that if you looked at those 93 years and you did a band of 2% around the 10% average, that on any given year, there were only six instances where the annual return of the S&P 500 was within two percentage points of the average. Think about that. So we throw out these numbers about average returns, and we're just using the S&P 500 as an example, is, yeah, the average return over the long term is 10%. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's true. But it's not really true. It's a little bit of a misconception or lie, not a nefarious lie, because only six times in the last 90 odd years did it ever even get close to the average. You had great years, you had bad years all over the place. So you never actually get an average return that's published on indexes or any long-term investments. You get your returns. So be careful when you hear average returns especially long-term average returns, any average returns, because that's not what you're going to get. You hear 10%, 
the thought is, wow, I'm going to get 10%. And then you get five or you get 20 or you get negative 10. You're going to set yourself up for disappointment if you believe these kind of longer term numbers and that's something that you're going to actually get. It's a lot messier than that. And that's a common misconception that we don't understand. And so I'm going to go through my top ones, and that's number one. And then I'm going to share some from some of my friends and planners on the that I know and converse with through Twitter, which is a great place to have conversations. My number two is we all are all going to spend consistently in retirement. So we talk about, okay, I need $100,000 a year to live my life in retirement. And then all the planning assumes you need $100,000 and that it increases by inflation over time. And then that's the number you use to do all of your planning and actually make some pretty important life decisions. Well, the problem is we do not spend that way. We do not spend X amount and then increase it by inflation every single year. And that is a misconception. And it's a horrible way to plan, in my humble opinion, because a couple of things happen when you are retiring. Well, one is your spending is lumpy right? You're going to have weddings, you're going to have cars, you're going to have travel that isn't going to happen throughout retirement. You're going to have random anniversary trips or gifts and donations. Your spending is going to be very, very lumpy. And when you retire, it's a lot about cash flow management. So you're going to have to plan out and try to forecast lumpiness in spending so you can make sure you pay for it. So that's number one of why that's a big lie or misconception. Number two is because if you take, say, $100,000 and you just inflate it by, let's say, 3% over a 30-year time frame, that's going to compound very nicely, meaning that each year it's going to be higher and higher and higher and more than double over your 20 to 30-year retirement time frame. You're not going to spend that way, most likely. And by just simply taking a flat beginning amount and inflating it over 30 years, it's very likely that it's going to drastically overestimate how much money you're going to need to live the kind of life that you want. But that's what, how we use it. That's wrong, in my opinion. Because what generally happens is, in addition to this lumpiness, is we have what we've talked about before, the go-go years where we want to make the most of life early in retirement and front load our experiences while we're healthy enough. And then we downsize our house. We slow down our travel in our slow go years. We'll call those the seventies. And, and then we have more no go years, which is a much more relaxed life, more like traditional retirement. Uh, we are on the park bench of life where we slow down even more and maybe our medical expenses increase. So that is a more nuanced and I think intelligent way to plan than just simply inflating. So that's number two on our list. My third one is using average returns and planning. Now, you know, we have Monte Carlo scenarios, stochastic modeling where we can randomize returns, but it's hard to do that, right? You getting the engines is not always easy. And it's much easier to build spreadsheets. We love spreadsheets. I love spreadsheets. And you can't really do Monte Carlo or modeling like that. So we use a 7% average. And maybe we even haircut the average knowing that there's some randomness around it. But if we use average returns, that linear return of whether it's 7% or 6% that we think we use as an assumption, well, when it's constant like that, that's pretty powerful over a long period of time. So as an example, let's just say we use 6% average annual return and we put that into our spreadsheet and we use a 4% withdrawal rate. Well, wow, on a spreadsheet, it's going to work, right? Because you're earning six and you're only taking four out. And that is very common. And we do that by necessity, but it's dangerous to make decisions just on that. Because even if you have an average of 6% long-term, as in what we talked about, you're not going to get it every year. You're going to get bad years, good years. And the sequencing of those returns is everything when you're making decisions. So you got to be careful there. And we know that a lot of times, but that we don't appreciate it as much as I think we need to. So that's number three. Number four 
is anything that influences decisions too heavily with the phrase of given today's environment. Whether it's interest rates, market levels, the election, China, tariffs, the Mideast, national debt, trade debt, global debt, presidency, which party controls Congress, where we're at in whatever cycle you're calling, we use those behaviorally as crutches too much. Because if we're matching our assets to our liabilities and focus more on cash flow planning, so our long-term investments are really long-term, almost all of these are not near as important as we pretend they are. And the next one is risk tolerance. Using a risk tolerance questionnaire, it's great for compliance. It really has nothing related to retirement planning because it's not what you can tolerate in optimizing a portfolio of that. It's about taking the minimal risk that you need to help assure the outcome that you want, but it's still a best practice. The 4% rule, I think, is a common misperception, and there's way too much written about it. It works really well in mathematical models. Academics love it for the most part. Maybe that's an overstatement, but a lot of people use it a lot. You read a lot of articles on it. People don't spend that way. And it's not as useful as I think we make it out to be. Now I'm going to go through some ones that uh, planner friends of mine had shared. Benjamin Brandt with a great podcast, Retirement Starts Today. He chimed in and said his common myth when it comes to retirement is depleting your portfolio is the worst thing that can happen to you. It's not. Depleting the portfolio could be part of your strategy, especially with longevity, because These are assets that are going to be needed for you. And especially (laughs) given this environment, I just said it, with interest rates, you're not the ability to clip coupons or and just live off of interest is not something that is viable. So depleting your portfolio is not necessarily a bad thing if done prudently to help you live the life that you want. Another uh, planner, Debbie Freeman says, another common myth is you're going to be fulfilled simply by not working. Definitely not true. The absence of work does not make you happy. Trust me on this one. I've seen it countless times. Work is essential. It may give you, not working may give you more freedom, but you're still going to have to do something with it. It doesn't make you happy by itself. Graham Miller's CFP shared one, which I had to laugh at. He said, one misconception is you'll not be tempted to buy an RV, a recreational vehicle. (laughs) He must listen to the show and know that we just went over the RV virus earlier this year. That pops up in your mid-50s and 60s. Joe Ferrer, CFP, says your taxes will be lower is a big misconception. And that is definitely true. If you are a diligent saver and you have been a good steward and done a lot of those things right, this is definitely something that we find is not the case a lot of the time. Jake Falcon Advisor said retirement is purely a financial decision is a common misconception. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of reasons to retire that aren't based on money. And sometimes even when the money might not make the most sense, it can still be a good decision if you're creative enough because you care about something more. It's not just about the money, but obviously it's important. Advisor Ryan Hughes says, A big misconception is that your portfolio should be more conservative during retirement. Yeah, your portfolio needs to be attached to the life goals that you have planned out, which totally changes how we construct portfolios in retirement. We've talked about that in the show. And then our friends at Boomer Benefits, they say a common misconception is, I paid for Medicare my entire working life. It will be free in retirement. (laughs) Ha ha. I don't think so. Nope. There are a lot of costs for Medicare. You get part A free, but there's still going to be a lot of costs involved with deductibles and other and co-pays and things like that. So definitely true. So I guess the point is a lot of these rules of thumb, they can make sense on the surface, but there's always so much deeper when it comes to creating your plan. And that's the key. Rules of thumb aren't about you, just like averages aren't about the market. It's about accomplishing the goals in your life and just following 
these high level rules or misconceptions can really lead you down some wrong paths. So with that, let's go into the practical planning segment and dive into the question, how long will you live? What do you got to plan for in our practical planning segment? So let's get this subject started with talking around how long you might live. Currently in the U.S., for a person that reaches the age of 65, they now are expected to live to 84 years of age. And the interesting thing about longevity is that the older you get, the more longevity moves out. So if you're 65 and you are expected to live to 84, when you're 66, now you're expected a little bit longer. It's like you've passed another test and you've gotten through that gauntlet of the year. And so odds continue to move in your favor at an ever decreasing rate. So to talk about this idea of longevity. First, let's talk about some of the big factors that are going to influence your longevity. So if we look at, um, you will know, start with gender. Gender is a big factor. Women generally live longer than men. The current life expectancy of man is about 76 years old, whereas a lady is almost 83. Some studies say that this is related to riskier behavior or accidents or higher rates of accidents. So, but gender, generally women are going to live longer than men. And I've seen that just in practical experience in my practice. The second big factor is just genetics. The genetic factors that are just linked to mortality rates, whether that's heart disease, cancer, respiratory, diabetes, kidney disease, Things that we are just now getting some emerging technology on to be able to handicap how much these are going to impact us specifically. I think that will probably be the future of a lot of medical research is the customized diagnosis for indicators of things and then how to actually deal with them. Very personalized healthcare rather than just working on averages now that we're starting to understand genetics even more. De definitely outside my expertise. But genetic factors are a big portion of longevity. The CDC lists the leading cause of death, right? Heart disease, cancer, chronic illness. A lot of these are genetically based. The third is, and this is an interesting one, is prenatal and childhood conditions. You know, what type of conditions you had in your early childhood and even in conditions in utero can have a big long-term impact on your overall longevity. How you handicap that and quantify that, I don't know. Another one is marital status. That is a big factor. Married people tend to have lower mortality rates than those that have never been married or those that are divorced. We don't know exactly why this is. It could be we're happier. Hmm. We make better health choices, but married people tend to live longer. Social economic status impacts life expectancy, which makes sense. And education impacts longevity, which makes sense. If you think of more educated you are, theoretically, you're going to make better choices. Obviously, your ethnicity is going to have an impact. We've seen that. And lifestyle choices and medical technology, those are all going to be the big factors that will impact your longevity, either for the good or for the bad. So we were having a discussion in the Rock Retirement Club about longevity. And a member, Denise, asked if there are any robust tools to help us handicap our personal longevity. And I was not aware of any at the time. And I went and did a little bit of research and found an article. This is at newretirement.com. Not familiar with the site, but they, they listed one from the New England Centenarian study, the largest study of people in the world living over 100. And so I went and checked it out. And they ask you almost 50 questions about your family history, your nutrition, your behavioral aspects, your medical history, nothing too intrusive. I went and took the test, of course, why not? And I'm 52 years old, and based on the answers that I gave as a 52-year-old, it says my life expectancy 
is 93 years old. So this is at living2100.com. It's by Professor Thomas Puris, MD, MPH, whatever that is. Don't know him, not familiar with this, but based on the research and taking the test myself, that seemed to be very robust, but I'm not familiar with the methodology behind it. Maybe I'll try to get him on the show later this month. We'll reach out to him. But that might be one, living to 100 and using the numerals 100.com. In my planning, I tend to say that I tend to use the male living to 92 and the lady living to 94, which in a lot of cases seems pretty high, but I think it makes it robust. And then we can test for living longer or dying early to see the impacts on the plan. But for what it's worth, that's what I use when I'm planning. And we just recently increased that. We used to use 90 for men and 92 for ladies. Now, the question, especially coming off last month's topic of technology, is what are some of the wild cards in this? I was reading a recent Forbes article, and they talked about you know the investment in this longevity issue. And they mentioned Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, having invested over $700 million into a company with the sole aim at extending human lifespans, working on things such as gene therapies, which have been shown to double expectancy in mice by knocking out two genes that are connected to aging. Other scientists, and I'm I'm quoting off and on here, are pursuing rejuvenation technologies that will help older people feel younger by removing toxins from their body that they believe contribute to some of the problems of aging. There's a lot of leading technology in reconstruction of parts that wear out. (laughs) We think of knee replacements right now, but we're going the direction of, if I need a new knee or new heart, potentially growing your own using your genetics and your chromosomes. I don't know how any of that works. Robotic replacement parts that are already in use. They mentioned 3D printed organs and tissues that are being developed and robotic organs. These are all some pretty crazy futuristic wild cards that if you're sitting here, like for me, for sure, like I'm 52 years old, some of this stuff is going to be there for me. If you're 60, you know, when you get to 75 or 80, how far will this stuff be developed? What will this do to our longevity? Now, you notice we're talking about longevity, not aging. I think of aging as deterioration, right? You know, great. Our body is functioned because I have all these robotic parts and replacement parts. What does this do to our mental capacity? Well, that's just another issue that we may need to dive into this month. In addition to all of this futuristic fancy stuff, just improvements in diagnostics to treat potentially life-threatening or shortening diseases or ailments early, we're getting a lot of innovation there that's just going to continue to evolve. So for what it's worth, my experience with cancer, with family and you know friends and just observation is modern medicine, a lot of it is reactive. Cancers aren't proactively searched for other than through PSA, I guess, for prostate and colon cancer. There's some preventative of trying to search for it, but it seems super common that a lot of times things get caught because the symptoms from the disease pop up. And then through figuring out what's causing the symptom, the disease is found. Again, I'm no doctor, but it seems a lot of times we're reacting to what the body is telling us rather than proactively having measures to say, ooh, this looks like it's on the horizon. I think there's a lot of technologies out there right now, but nobody knows how robust they are. It doesn't seem like they do anyway. And so it's an emerging technology that isn't reliable enough, I guess, to give us those indicators to be a little bit more proactive on, hey, this is in the early stages, let's deal with it now. Because the earlier you can catch things, it seems like the the better that we're going to be off. But that is evolving very quickly. 
definitely wellness and the whole idea of wellness and being proactive about that is is something that's more popular than ever, which I think makes total sense. So I see it quoted every now and then that theoretical studies suggest that the maximum human lifespan is around 125 years. Don't know where that comes from, but okay. I've seen it quoted a lot. What about these wild cards? You know, if we're planning that we're living in our early 90s to be quote unquote conservative, how quickly could these wild cards drastically extend that? That's a little scary to figure out. Now, I I don't want to get too caught up in, well, I got to plan for that now. We got to test for it. But you you don't want to make too many decisions now based on the fact that you could live to 110 because of these wild cards. What that will end up doing is potentially making you work a lot more and sacrifice more of your life right now in order to try to save, save, save for another day. We definitely got to be prudent and good stewards of that, but we got to be balanced too, right? Because today is the only life you really have. So it's that stewardship standpoint where, remember the teeter-totter, live well today, but also make sure we're living well later on. And those two are, those are competing interests. It's easy to tip too far one way or the other way. We want to find balance between those two. So we'll have to think through that. So I think the story is on how long you're going to live. You can use this life expectancy calculator from living to 100. I think that will be an interesting experiment for you. I personally use 92 and 94 for ages for men and women today. And we want to plan on that and we want to adjust because even those ages, we want to adjust based on some historical family history and, and whether we smoke or not. We want to adjust downwards or upwards based on some of these main factors that could influence it. But ultimately, we're always going to just have to stay agile. So next week in our practical planning segment, we're going to dive into eight habits that we can build today now to age well into the future because habits become everything as we get older, which we'll talk about next week. But let's go get happy with Nicole. Hey, welcome to the Happy Lab, where we are here to noodle on how to live a happier life with my one of my best friends, Nicole Rockstar Mills. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Roger. So we're talking about getting old, Nicole. Okay. And you're like 30-something. But you know it's coming. So how are you going to embrace this getting old feeling now that you're in your mid-30s? Well... I'm kind of looking forward to the part of being old where you just get to say what you want and people are like, oh, she's old. <laughs> they just, they don't call you on it or anything. They're just like, uh, old. You have no problem saying what you want with me. Well, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> now, rumor has it that you have something that has appeared on your head. Yes, it's true. Bum, bum, I have bum. a gray hair. <laughs> oh, it's the first of many. It's the first of many. How well, do you I feel? Hope, I hope the rest of them are less crazy looking than this one. Well, what's, it, what's it doing? <laughs> it's just like short and sort of like curlier than the rest of my hair. I don't know. Then it sticks straight out of my head. It's just, uh, it's not the color that bothers me. It's the weird texture of it. Did you pluck it or did you leave it? Oh, heck yes, I plucked it. Did you? <laughs> and what was your husband's comment? At least I have hair. <laughs> he is a little hair challenged as, I, as am I. Yes, he finally at Christmas time, he went for it and he shaved his head. Now, so now part of getting old, and you have really young kids, but then you have this whole grandparent thing. Is that label going to be scary to you? Some people don't like that label. No, I can't wait. I want them to call me granny and I'm going to have too many treats in my house. And yeah, you're, you gonna are going to be a great grandmother. Fun hats. I mean, I think it's going to be great. <laughs> I can't wait. So you're not going to be like me, ma or any of that stuff. You're going to be just Grammy. Granny. Well, my, so I have three grandmothers. Technically I have a step grandmother that 
also is like my grandmother, but um, my granny and I were particularly close, my dad's mom. So I'm hoping that granny, I, that might be too hard for them to say. I know sometimes kids get to pick based on what they can say, but I had fingers a, crossed. I, I had two grandmothers. One was grandma and the other one was nag nag. <laughs> nag nag. Nag <laughs> nag. Man man and nag nag. <laughs> Is that because that's what you could say or that's what it, she did? I don't know where it came from, but she I will talk about her at some point on the show, but she was an amazingly interesting Is this the woman. one that sang Tiny Bubbles? No, like that you was talked grandma. about in your book? That was oh, okay. Grandma. No, this was, Nag Nag was one time we were over at her house. Man Man was already gone and we were watching a news station and there was a little segment on grandparents and they talked about how grandmas, they have all, you know, their own particular this and that and their own particular smells. And she got so in a fun way, smells, what are you talking about? And literally with us, she, we called the station <laughs> to complain or ask about what smells do grandmas have? Do I smell? She well, was, they could have good smells. I no, mean, it, lots of grandmothers bake and grow flowers. I mean, she did smells it aren't necessarily a, bad. She did it all as a joke, but just for our benefit, I think. That's it, funny, it, though. It was very funny. But anyway, we can all be happy as we age. Embrace it, because it's going to happen anyway. On your marks, get set. <laughs> And we're off <laughs> to set a seven-day goal to take a little baby step to live a happier life in rock retirement. In the next seven days, why don't you journal or just noodle on how you're going to handle embracing the natural progression of getting older? How are you going to face it? Are you going to pluck every gray hair and dye your hair? There's nothing wrong with that. Or are you going to embrace it and shave off your head if you're losing hair like I do? Shave your hair, not your whole head. Don't shave your head. But just noodle on how you're going to deal with this. Because a lot of us don't want to think about it and then we act out about it unintentionally. And we don't want to be unintentional. Not on this show. So in the next seven days, just do a little bit of noodling on how you're going to embrace the natural state of things and make the most of it. Well, we have a special announcement here. In September, we are doing a retirement plan live. Now, if you're new to the show, this is a live case study where we choose a subject, a listener from the show, so it could be you. We hide their identity. The subject and I walk through the retirement planning process and we record our conversations and you, my friend, get to listen in as we learn about what their dream is for retirement, what resources they have to fund their retirement, and some of the things they're excited about and some of the things they're concerned about. You get to listen in on the show. And then we do a live webinar where we reveal whether their plan is going to work or not. Uh, so we're excited about this. It's coming in September. But here's the reason I'm telling you about it in June is we need somebody. Right, Nicole? That's right. We Calling need... all volunteers. Whoa, we need a subject for our experiment. And so this time, what we want is, Nicole, why don't you describe what we're looking for? In the past, we've done a single person. We've done somebody who was kind of didn't have a pension or was living off of, you know, less than the typical retirement. This time we're hoping to find someone who has experienced an unexpected event in the last five years that will impact your retirement. And that could mean anything. I, it's kind of up to you. Um, that could be an unexpected layoff, or maybe you changed industries and now you're in a job you love and you want to work longer. It could be a divorce. Could be a divorce. It could, it could be... be a uh, health issue. Um, it's sort of open-ended, but we'd like to find somebody that had a major life-changing, retirement-changing event in the last five years and just you know talk to you a little bit about it and see if it would be good fit for our retirement plan life. Yeah. So where should they go if they think they might fit this? 
So for the entire month of June, we will be putting a link in Six Shot Saturday that will go to an application page. And if you think this fits you and you've got a great story, please click on the link and send us your info and we'd love to talk to you. Yes. And so Six Shot Saturday, we never talk about that on the show, which is just horrible. We're totally missing the best practices of podcasting, by the way. But that's okay. We have a <laughs> I'm week- sure that's not the only one. <laughs> I'm missing. sure it's not. We make our own rules here on the show. So Six Shot Saturday is a weekly email where we send out six quick tips to help you rock retirement. And you can go to rogerwhitney.com and right there on the homepage that you can sign up for Six Shot Saturday. It just comes Saturday morning, real quick email to help keep you intentional. So if you're not a member of Six Shot Saturday, you can go to rogerwhitney.com and it's right there on the homepage and you can enter your name and email. We would love to chat with you if you think you might be a good fit for this. And uh, we're excited about our next edition of Retirement Plan Live. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.